Like, what if someone was like, can you write, like, a landscape drama? I could do it. could do it. Well, it would be, because then it would be the fun of observing the conventions of landscape dramas and seeing how they work and fit together. And um, it would probably be more of a brain book, but it's still fun. I love the sound of it. So you should move to Canada and you should write the great Canlit book. <laughs> Could I write it under a pseudonym? I have so many names ready. Why not? <laughs> Looks really saved my life. Thank you so much, Helen, for coming and talking to us. I know that you're in hot demand right now. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, really. Well, this is the last stop on my on my book tour, and I just I'm very glad that it's here. And, oh, good. And somewhat overwhelmed by <laughs> seeing so many people. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, good. Yeah, well, we're lucky to be here. Um, this is a special event, and um, I'm going to jump right into it. Mm -hmm. So Helen's book's been out for a little while, but not a long time, so I'm assuming some of us have read it, some of us are probably still reading it. Um, I read it twice. One thing I'm going to say is that there's a lot going on in this book. Yes. Um, it's... <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, maybe we should just start with um, the simplest thing, which is gingerbread. Yes. Um, what should I say about gingerbread? <laughs> so I mean, it's, Let's it's, just talk it's, about what it is, because I know you really like it. I do. Well, like is a strange word. It's more that I wanted to know it. Um, so I see it as something symbolic, and I was interested in the way that it's simultaneously repulsive and enticing. Um, so I wanted to, I don't know, find out what gingerbread means. In the beginning of the book, we find out that Harriet, who's probably the most prolific gingerbread maker mm. of all the many gingerbread makers in the story, actually makes two kinds. She makes a hard kind and a soft kind. Yeah. So that means there's not really one kind of gingerbread. Um, well, it's the same recipe. I think it's just a textural difference. Um, which happened to me because I was baking so much gingerbread when I was writing the book that there were, <laughs> there were accidental <laughs> textural differences. And are you still making and eating gingerbread? Um, I don't make it anymore, but I do eat a lot of it, yes. <laughs> One thing that's really interesting about gingerbread is that it's a food, it's a building material. Mm -hmm. um, there's it's, a suggestion... It's a form of currency. It's a form of currency. Mm -hmm. um, in the story, there's a suggestion that some people are literally made of gingerbread. Yes. So, what is that? Like, it's kind of uh, loaded. Yeah. I think at some point I became quite abstracted, but there is... <laughs> I suppose the point that I was getting at is that gingerbread as a food, and maybe food in general, um, comfort foods, foods that, um, that have ancient histories that have been handed down, they tend to be a vessel um, for, I guess, our ideas about um, not just people and home and things like that, but um, almost comfort itself. The two, um, there's two friends in the book that are very close in age and they each end up with a very special ring that has possibly magical properties, just symbolic value. Um, one, the, the, the focus of the book is, is often on the experience of being an adolescent. And I wondered, is there sort of like a loss of innocence associated with eating the gingerbread? Um. I should say we agreed. I promised not to ask philosophical questions. Yeah, and then, <laughs> and then here we are. Here <laughs> and we are, and then just anyway. like, ah. Um, no, this is, um, so there was some sort of link between gingerbread and childhood, I suppose, because that well-known story where we have the gingerbread house um, that's used as a sort of trap, mm -hmm. um, but also but a very specific sort of trap, a trap for children who are already very hungry. Um, I think with most people, if there are a lot of biscuits on a the plate, they probably won't choose the gingerbread unless they're really hungry, just because they have other biscuits that they prefer or just the, that, that simultaneously creepy sweet thing about gingerbread. Um, but when it's your only option, then it becomes like the ultimate food and the ultimate nourishment. Um, 
And so going from thinking about that connection between gingerbread as enticing to hungry children, um, I found myself sort of writing this interlude with the gingerbread girls where, where you had these girls that were kind of commodifying their own childhood and performing childhood for adults who, who were missing their lost youth or whatever those adults were there for. I'm still not sure why those adults visited the gingerbread girls. Um, but yeah, just that kind of confusing space where um, childhood and biscuits collide. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of lovely interplay between a world that we would recognize and a world that breaks the rules of this world. So the gingerbread girls are sort of plucked from their native land, which we're going to talk about in a second, and installed in a gingerbread theme parkish. They all live in a house, and they're the gingerbread girls, and they sort of like perform this um, schoolgirl innocence, even though, as we see, gingerbread's really not innocent. Like, it could mm -hmm. be, but it's also kind of malicious, and um, at some point, it's even deadly for people. Mm -hmm. it's, it seems to depend on the eater. <laughs> In a lot of ways. <laughs> That's interesting. Do so you think for some people it's got more going on? Um, yes, I think, I think for some people it's probably quite dangerous, but what's interesting is that the person who loves gingerbread the most is Gretel, um, who we first encounter in the story having thrown someone down a well. So Gretel is kind of um, not amoral, but, <laughs> but she definitely has a wicked edge to her. Um, and I think Gretel's liking the gingerbread is what worries Harriet because Gretel's the only person she's ever met who just loves this gingerbread unconditionally. And she wonders what that means, that a person like this loves her gingerbread and everyone else rejects it. Do you think it's because Gretel's a rich girl and she's never had to make the gingerbread? Uh, oh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a very classist reading of gingerbread. But <laughs> well, <laughs> I think... Um, the well is a good example of a way that you are playing with myth or fairy tales and really taking the aspects of it that work for you and, and changing them. Um, the ch so this is a story about gingerbread in a gingerbread land with some gingerbread characters, but it's not Hansel and Gretel. No. And also, I don't know, with the well, I think what I was interested in was that it was a blank space that became filled in by throwing gingerbread down it. So there was this well and everyone said there was no story, but then Harriet drops some gingerbread down the well and this girl appears and it's like, what? It's the story is being made right before your eyes and it's, it's like gingerbread is an ingredient in a bigger story. And I thought that was, it just went along that way. I didn't know that that, that was how Harriet and Gretel were going to meet. It's, it was like watching people come out of thin air as I was writing. How do you write? I, I've heard that you don't outline rigorously, but so yeah, you do. What you don't outline rigorously? No, I don't. Yeah, um, yeah, I just write. I had a, I had some idea of some things that I wanted to happen, but it was more following a character, um, which was Harriet, and just sort of getting her to the end in one piece. <laughs> <laughs> that was the plan. <laughs> Um, there's a strong theme of mothers and daughters, and there's also a theme of fathers and sons. So mm -hmm. it might help if we if briefly describe the plot without giving too much away. So um, there's a, a woman that we meet first, and she's concerned about her daughter. And then what we end up going is back into the mother's story, partly as a way of bridging a connection between the two women. So I would say that by the end of the book, we sort of, at least the, the daughter understands her mother's story and the mother sort of explained her mother's story. So we're sort of seeing like these three generations. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Um, it does. But I don't know about it as a connecting of generation story um, per se, just because I think the daughter asked the mother, so the daughter asked the mother, how did you get here? And she's She's not just asking in a sort of, tell, tell me the tale of our ancestors sort of way. It's like, how did you actually get here? Because this country that you came from, I, I got there in a, in a crazy way by just slipping into a coma after eating, after eating gingerbread. <laughs> so she's like, how did you get here? Like, it's a very um, practical question of, um, of time, and, uh, time and space. It's not a, it's not a metaphysical or, his, or family history question. Um, 
And so I think that the answer has to be equally like elaborate and far-fetched and um, all of these things. And it's partly, it partly has that tone because you have this mother who's, her daughter can't speak anymore and she's like desperate to heal her. So she has that sense of trying to entertain her into being better. Um, so yeah, for me, my, a lot of it is the way that it is told um, mm -hmm. rather than any sort of overview of, of the, what the story carries, if that makes any sense. Yes, there's a real sense of, I think, your voice in the story, which in the, by which I mean there is a voice. It, it has a, a real, not lyrical quality, but it feels like something that could have existed long ago when you sort of unearthed it and put it on the page. I think it's Gretel's voice. It's Gretel's voice, yeah. Mm. Um, two really interesting things that just came to mind when you said that. So we should talk about Juastrana, which is a country that may or may not exist. Um, and that's what Helen was referring to when she's talking about going, you, you know, a mother telling a daughter, I come from this country that you don't know about. Um, in the book, Juastrana has an ambiguous Wikipedia page. Like, you read it and you're like, hmm. <laughs> in our world, Juhastrana doesn't have a Wikipedia page yet, but someone in this room could go home and write it. Mm -hmm. But I did check, and there's like a hip hop band in Slovakia. I discovered this from reading reviews. So it's um, a coincidence. <laughs> Apparently, these reviewers thought that I had been inspired by this band. I was like, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. But then also, um, a couple of Czech friends who have been reading it tell me that there are other Druhastranas already in stories. Um, and so I'm kind of, I guess I have added more to the, <laughs> to the, the narrative of Druhastrana. Yeah. Well, one reason I thought it might be interesting for us here in Canada is that the notion of where your parents came from. Um, many of us are settlers, immigrants. Some people are indigenous, so they come from the land. But there's this idea of your parents trying to explain your origins to you. And the character of Perdita, who's the daughter of Harriet, the other woman that I um, mentioned that's asking all these questions, is trying to understand a place that she's never seen, she may never go to, she only has her mother's word to take. But she has been there. Well, she has, yes. And, so in the and that's, that's why the whole thing, that's why the whole story begins, because she's like, I've been there, but I don't understand how I've been there, because everyone says this place doesn't exist. <laughs> so it's kind of... Later on, there's... Um, an attempt by some other characters to learn the language, Druhastranian, and um, a sort of allegation by a son that his dad is just making this up, like, how do I know this is even real? Um, thinking about place and belonging, which seems to be a theme that comes through here, Druhastranians, you say, we're all Druhastranians, like, none of us feel that we belong or that we're all estranged? Mm. I don't know. I mean, one of the things that was interesting when writing it was that it became um, sort of malleable, a malleable place um, politically. So it became a place that alienated people could say, OK, I belong to this place as a way of expressing that they didn't feel that they belonged anywhere. But it's a tricky one because, yeah, for Harriet, it actually is a place. <laughs> and she actually has come from there. It's just the logistics that are difficult to explain. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I suppose there are questions of not whether countries exist per se, but whether they are recognized. Um, so for Drew Hastrana, and maybe part of the reason why it has the Czech name is because only Czechs um, say that it exists. Um, so there's some sort of claim as if, if you can name it, then in some way it is yours, <laughs> um, but about a land. Um, you have said, well, it's easy for me to look at a country like Drew Hastrana Juhastrana and say, oh, it's a metaphor for um, not necessarily America, but I thought about the polarization of wealth that's happening in, in society. Like some people have a lot, a lot of people are really poor and struggling and they buy lottery tickets to try to get themselves out of their, their poverty. Mm -hmm. um, you've said you don't overtly think about politics when you're doing this kind of writing that you just kind of want to play, but... I do want to play, but obviously it's there are so many things in the book and there are so many reflections. I suppose it's why I sort of pull a face when people describe Druhastrana as fantastical or fairy tale. Like, I'm like, not really. Like, no. there isn't any of the descriptions that I couldn't have just pulled from a newspaper article. 
Um, there are some exaggerations, for example, the hybrids, <laughs> the, the animal plant hybrids, but other than that, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think the agenda was to make it seem like a place that was so other and so far away from um, any, anything that we live in. It doesn't currently. feel far away. I thought of, of when did you start writing this? Was it, it, it would was, have been before Trump was elected? Uh, and Hungary and all the populism that's happening in Europe? I started just before, it was definitely after Brexit. It was like November, November 2016. So it's interesting because these are things that are in the air now. Um, how should society be organized? What is equality? And they're very much themes of fairy tales that were in Brothers Grimm. Poor people trying to get ahead or trying to just survive. Um, so whether you were overtly trying to make a statement or not, it just seems very contemporary to me. Oh, good, because it is it <laughs> contemporary. I mean, it is, I, I like, I don't really know how to discern it, because it's, it kind of seems like I'm trying to discern what's in the book, which is not that, it's just that all that is in the book, but it's not, for me, the main thing. Yeah. And then if you ask me what the main thing is, then I'm just like, oh, you just have to read it and find out. Because it's... <laughs> because it's um, it's like any book, like there's so much in it and it has to have an, aggre an aggregate effect, like other, you can't pull out one thing and say that this is it. Um, even though it's, it's got some tough themes and definitely some sort of darkness to it, you said this is a really fun book to write. Can you talk about the fun of that? Um, it was... When I think about some of my favorite writers, what they do really well is capturing that sense of being alive, which is not knowing what on earth is going to happen in the next moment. Um, and with some writers, there's a sort of terror that comes with that. And with others, it's just you, you feel free, strangely free, and probably foolishly free, but still ah, so free. Um, and that was how I felt writing. Um, it was. It was as if I had changed from a noun to a verb, and I was just telling. Um, was that recent in your career? Have you had that before? This is her I've eighth a, book. I've had it with a few books. Um, the first one was Mr. Fox, which is still my favorite, just because it saved me. <laughs> um, but yeah, when I'm, when I'm writing like that, that's my favorite. And it feels like I can, do, I can put heart and mind, because there were a few books I've written that was, that was just brain books. And, I did them as sort of voice exercises. Um, not to say that I didn't work hard, like I, <laughs> we all do our best all the time, um, but yeah, it was introverted, it was especially fun. Do you fear failure? No, I just sort of live with it. <laughs> <laughs> like it's, it's, it's okay. Um, you can handle it if you try something and you feel like it's not working. No, I think that I have, I have failed, like I, everything that everything that I do <laughs> is, is that, but because you had such a big idea of what it was going to be like, and then it, and then it just is not that, which is fine. Um, but it's also just something that comes with having very big goals, I think, um, and a very specific idea of what kind of story you want um, to put into the world. Did you have a creative goal that you were working towards with this one? I wanted it to be like gingerbread in some way, like the mm -hmm. consumption of it. <laughs> um, I think you succeeded. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's complicated, it's funny, it's, it's sometimes difficult. You have to read it, you know, I said I really did um, read it closely, much more closely than I would um, a lot of books, and yet it's very satisfying. Yay, then it was like... <laughs> well, no, I think, I think it asks... I think it does ask a lot of the reader, but I also think that... I think that you can find a lot there if you look. Which I guess is the same with most books, but... Yeah. No, it's not, the, it's not the case with all books. Um, and I'm also curious about this idea, like... Some writers really plan their books, they'll outline down to the detail, and I think that comes back to just the fear of doing something that's not good or not, not being comfortable in their own head. 
So what is your process like? Like you had this idea, gingerbread, and then how did you go about realizing that? I think I'm more afraid of the book not being alive or lively than, than I am of it not being good. Because mm -hmm. um, I think you can read something that's sort of rough around the edges, and but it still has this sort of boisterous energy, and that makes up for a lot, I think. Um, so I just... I had Harriet, and then suddenly her daughter appeared, and then suddenly her mother appeared. It, literally, it was just sort of... I guess just being at home on a Sunday morning and all these people come around and you're like, oh, and this person's here, and this person's here, and this person's here, and then you have to accommodate them all. Um, so when the book became a sort of, yeah, a tea party, a Mad Hatter's tea party. And you just made room for them all. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they wouldn't leave. <laughs> How long was the process of doing this one? Um, I actually, this is a book where, oh, I think I touched on this. I think it came back. Um, this is the first book where I put the dates um, just because I had gone to South Korea yeah. to start it, and I was curious about where and when I would finish it. So I made a note of the start and finish dates, but I think it was November to April. So I started it in Bupyong um, in November, and yeah, finished in Prague in April. And in between, <laughs> in between I went to North Korea, <laughs> and it was kind of, huh. But I had to sign a contract that I wouldn't write anything about um, about the trip to North Korea. So, so we can't say that gingerbread has anything to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. The Japanese have their own form of gingerbread in your book. They do, yeah, tsuhashi. Is there is delicious. A, see, I, I wondered, um, gingerbread is something we know about, but I don't think it's something that we necessarily eat that much. Except for at Christmas. Where you live, people eat it more, right? Yeah, um, there is the, there's a good Czech tradition of gingerbread paranique, um, which is, it's heavier, um, but quite delicious. I went to Padubice, which is the sort of town most famous for gingerbread in Czechia, and they had a Hansel and Gretel cottage. And really? <laughs> there's a witch who teach, teaches you the correct way to sit on a shovel. Um, <laughs> and things like that. Seems like something that wouldn't be allowed here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you moved to Prague how many years ago? Um, I first moved there in 2010. Um, That's quite a while. It is, but then I moved around because I, I didn't know anything about um, the Czech Republic and I just loved Prague so much that it seemed slightly suspicious or maybe delusional. I was like, what is the connection that I feel with this place? Um, so then I was talking with a friend and he said that I should date other cities. Mm -hmm. so, I went, so I went to Berlin and Budapest. I was end up being in Budapest for a year and then I just missed Prague too much. So I came back in 2013. Do you know how long you'll stay in Prague? Hopefully indefinitely. That's great. So that's like, you've lived in five major cities um, in your life? Because you were born in Nigeria and you lived in London? I don't know. Yeah. It doesn't matter, I found Prague. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you show your work to other writers when you're working on something? Yes, and Marina Endicott was reading Gingerbread all the way through. Um, and uh, she was so lovely about it. She kind of gave me the strength to continue. <laughs> you take the advice people give you? Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fascinated by this idea of the confident writer, because so many people aren't. Oh, do I seem confident? I'm just despairing. It's more as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, when you say that um, you enjoyed writing your book, many people just suffer, and then it's done, and then they suffer again. Mm -hmm. But so you definitely have either seen an arc. Like, does it get easier you, as you get older? Um, no, each book is, is equally difficult, but I think that that's the reason why I decided to just have fun with books now, just because if I've at least had a good time, then it can be enough. Mm -hmm. um, and then other responses are just either a bonus or indifferent too. Could you imagine doing anything else with your life? Many, many things. I think that's the, that's the thing about being a reader. It just always makes you want to be someone else, and then you do get to be someone else from reading. Um, so, yeah, I have a lot of ideas, but no skills. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think some of us would not 
agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> What's your relationship with reviews or success? Do you care about that? Um, sometimes a review can be very interesting because it kind of pulls out something in a book that you didn't know was there and that you're genuinely surprised by. Um, and I like those kind of reviews. But also I really like... I like reviews where it seems like the reviewer read it in the spirit in which it was written. Mm -hmm. um, just, of a, just because of the radical generosity of that, it's like, oh. Let's talk maybe about what's in the book a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, I think we should maybe go over what happens after Perdita comes back and she and her, sorry, I'm explaining this wrong. So there's three women. There's Harriet, sort mm -hmm. of the mother and the daughter, and Perdita that is her child. Yes. And then there's Harriet's mother. Mm -hmm. um, and so we see a little bit of all of their, their stories. Towards the end of the book, it seems to speed up a little bit to me. Um, and it gets much more into like romantic relationships between people. What's your kind of like take on human nature? Hmm. Like we sort of like good people or bad people? Huh. <laughs> um, well, there's like two dudes that are kind of like good but not good. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I think the speeding up towards the end is more to do with, because Perdita has to be born, because there are these two different timelines, right, where it's yeah. kind of like, these are the beginnings, and then, yeah, it's kind of, it's time to reveal who Perdita's father is, and so on and so forth. Human nature. Well, um, okay, so, hmm. people have the, like, there's, um, one of the descriptions of Druhastrana is that it's a place where people would sort of do anything to get ahead, like, the one thing that they've all agreed on or that they, they've, what, what defines them as a society is that they'll sort of like sell anyone out if they can get ahead more than their neighbor. So to me, that was a sort of cynical view of people, but then I thought it's also informed by lack of resources. Mm, it is, but then you also have... Um, we meet different kind of kinds of Druhastranians in the story of which Harriet and Margot are. And they would never sell each other up. They've stuck together um, through various mishaps and so on. And so maybe part of being Druhastranian is like making claims that are not, that can't be backed up as well. Um, I don't know if there's a particular view of human nature in Ginger Road, but I think that there is maybe a view of life and um, Life isn't sort of ill-natured, it's just dirt poor like any other public resource. Yeah, I think that that's... that's I think that's the best line in the up. book. <laughs> to me. Thank you. Did you guys get that? I think it's like... Like, we don't mean for... We don't mean to be bad, we don't mean to be mean to each other, but when you think about it, it's so short and we have so little, so... Of course, it's right. kind of hard scrabble. And so you can't really be that angry with someone for just trying to survive like even if you do you get knocked out of the way while they're trying to do that um but that might just be a borrowed view so i'm thinking particularly of barbara cummins who's all of his books i love um but when i had finished ginger red and i was trying to think about what it was um i thought of her book the skin chairs and how what's the name of it the skin chairs okay um it's sort of a problem novel, at least that's how I think of it, in that the main character is this girl who lives next door to um, someone who just bought some chairs that are covered in human skin. And he like invites her over and he's like, what do you think of these chairs that are covered in human skin? And she freaks out. She can't believe what she's looking at. And she also goes into this spiral of abjection. Um, she almost starts to see herself as something analogous to the skin chair. She realizes that at some point she will no longer be breathing and she'll just be skin that can be put on a chair. And the rest of the novel becomes this kind of furious 
imaginative reckoning um, with that fate. She tries to exist in the same world as the skin chairs exist and somehow balance that out. And um, it's just one of those novels in which nothing really happens, but everything happens. Um, and with Gingerbread, <laughs> I, I suppose it's like the skin chairs, but with Gingerbread, Harriet is trying to work out what her gingerbread is worth, um, what she wants from the world in exchange for it. Um, how can she live in this world that doesn't want her gingerbread, <laughs> and so on. She's a very interesting figure. Um, at the beginning of the book, there's this really vivid description of Harriet trying to make friends with the PPA of her child's school, which we would call the PTA, like the Parent Teacher Association. And the other people are kind of not that nice. Like, they're just obsessed with their own child and their own lives. Um, but then when something does happen to Harriet's child, at least one person is kind. They, they make the paper cranes and, and bring them. So it seems to me that even within the selfishness of humans, there's, you, you're optimistic, like there's, there's good and bad qualities. Um, I think it all depends. Sometimes um, it seems like connecting with someone or knowing someone seems to depend on whether you feel like you have something to offer them, like you personally have something to offer them personally. Um, so when Harriet's daughter gets so sick, there is that one member of the PPA who thinks, oh, I know what to do. Um, the others don't have a clue, and so they retreat back into their world. They're like, I have nothing to offer this woman who's in such a terrible state. But there is that one member, and yeah, she sends the cranes because that is, that is the right thing to do, and it works. Harriet thought about how a lot of people are just looking for acquaintances. That was another um, line, and it made me think of social media, actually. Your characters are very modern to me. Like, the girls wear cool fashion. They're definitely of this world in some way, but I don't notice a lot of people, they're not on their phone, they're not, they're not tweeting or something like that. Um, what do you make of the role of social media in our world? Mm, it's just part of it, I'm neutral towards it. Um, I'm frightened of Twitter, but aside from that, everything, <laughs> it's just, it's a good way of staying in touch with people. In fact, on the whole, I, yeah, find them I didn't, I didn't leave out of the book like as a, <laughs> as a comment. Well, it is sort of about childhood. So like when they're, when the gingerbread girls are growing up, they're reading books. They're not looking at iPads or something like that. Yeah, and that, that kind of was my childhood up until, a, up until a certain point. And then in the very early days of the internet, I was on, oh, I remember these, these messaging boards where I was arguing with people about Buffy the Vampire Slayer. We had like these <laughs> really intense like, plot conversations. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you were always a reader? Yeah, um, hopefully still am. Yes. Still am. <laughs> um, I'd love to know a few other writers you're reading right now that you're really excited about. Um, hmm. Mm-hmm. My mind always goes completely blank when I'm asked this, and I had so many. Well, what about other um, writers that look like they're having fun? Hmm. It's hard to tell. <laughs> it's, really, it's really hard to tell, but I really love, um, I love Jesse Ball's books. Um, I think that he's just brilliant. Everything he does is kind of, well, you can read it five or six different ways. Um, and also there's this kind of, has a, an antique quality almost. Um, so there'll be sort of duels, duels at midnight and strange chess games and um, chases down alleyways and you're not sure when and where this is happening and it's now, um, things like that. Um, I love Heather O'Neill, um, her writing is glorious, just glorious. Um, and, and obviously I love Marina's books, but I, I don't know if she has fun. Like I, 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 I'm almost afraid to ask her if she's, if she's having fun with books. I think it's um, safe to say that most writers that I know really care about their work, but it's hard. I can't think of anything harder to do. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why we're always drawn to people 
like you, if you seem to be enjoying yourself or it seems, something seems to come easily to you, that's sort of like, well, what's the secret? What's the lesson? What, mm-hmm. um, what would you tell someone that's blocked or hates themselves? Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> huh. I don't know. Um, so there's this book called The Spinsters by um, George Gissing. Mm-hmm. And one spinster says to another, what message have you for the weak of spirit? And the other one says, none whatsoever. And I, almost, I almost feel like that's me. Um, <laughs> so, so you're like, I'm just like, just that's great. Talking up. <laughs> In Prague, are most of your friends writers or not? Uh, I don't see I hardly see anyone. Yeah, that's um, what I wonder. Yeah, it's good. You said something. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes me sound like a misanthrope, but that's not it. That's not it. I read somewhere that you said that you're misbranded as a traveler because really you just pack your bags, go somewhere, and then never leave the house. <laughs> That's actually close. I do leave sometimes for pancakes. I found a great, a very great pancake place in Prague. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, I think we'd probably love to hear a bit more about what you want to write next. It's a train book. It's set on a train. It's set on a train? Yeah. Is it an Eastern European train? It's an everywhere train. Ah, like a nomadic train? Yeah, let's call it that. (laughs) (laughs) But I'm excited about it. I think it's going to be fun. Um, We're going to go to questions in a little while, so Mm -hmm. if you have one, start formulating it now. And then um, Danielle will give us a signal when it's time to go. I think you seem to have a really, well, first of all, an international writing community that you work with, but also just an international perspective on being a person now? Oh, I hope so. Um, I almost feel like I... Well, I worry that I ignore specifics um, because if I really love a story, I just go into it. Um, Part of the reason why I started going to Seoul in the first place was because I became obsessed with Korean TV drama. And I just just watch the stories. It's like a pure shot of narrative. Um, Like what? This is an electric feeling. Um, so the one that I would recommend um, is called My Love from the Star, and it's about an actress who lives next, next door to a centuries-old alien, and at the same time, the CEO of her entertainment company is trying to murder her. So it's this kind of mix of, um, of mystery and romance and yeah. philosophical comment, and um, it, remind, it reminds me of Golden Age Hollywood, actually, just the, the fact that it tonally zigzags in all sorts of ways. And also everybody, everybody says exactly what they think. Um, and also there is some kind of special status for lovers. Like if, if you are loved or if you love, then you are some way protected within the story. Nothing too bad can happen to you. It's the people who aren't sincere that are in danger. And I think that's so interesting. Um, but there are so many. I gave a lecture on K-drama in Seattle two years ago. Like there, there are so many different it sounds, it sounds amazing. It sounds like something you would write. There are. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. I went, I, so when I went to Seoul for the second time, I stayed for six weeks in this district called um, Digital Media City, which is where all the dramas are filmed, and I was just like hanging around the studios hoping. <laughs> I think if it was a K-drama, like, someone would like, discover me and be like, do you want to write K-drama? But, no. <laughs> that never happened. <laughs> is there anything you would never write? No. No. No, I would try it all. I hope I have time to try it all. <laughs> like, what if someone was like, can you write, like, a landscape drama? I could do it. could do it. Well, it would be, because then it would be the fun of observing the conventions of landscape dramas and seeing how they work and fit together. And um, it would probably be more of a brain book, but it's still fun. I love the sound of it. So you should move to Canada mm-hmm. and you should write the great <laughs> Canlit book. <laughs> Could I write it under a pseudonym? I have so many names ready. Why not? 